Okay. Uh, I'm way too nervous today. Uh, a talk, unlike any other talk I've done, usually I can get away with uh, a couple of jokes. I can get away with a couple of my slides. This is a more technical uh, presentation, uh, born out of a desire to have a proper REST API for a project I'm working on that's Active Voyager, the replacement of the current Act software we use to organize Perl conferences and Perl workshops. There was a guy that has tried to do that before, and he said you will fail miserably on the whole project. And he was of the intention to actually completely write a new web framework to make Act work on a new thing, and I thought to myself, I have a bunch of good people around me that are developing Dancer 2. I can probably rely on their support and maybe they can help me writing some um, plugins to make um, Dancer 2 even more easy to use. Writing REST API, uh, REST APIs, that's what this talk will be about, can be a horrible nightmare. So let's see how I think you can solve it. That's me. I don't know where this picture has been taken. Somebody said that's an old picture of you. I have a better one of you. Fine. Um, good. Make hard things possible. I don't know who said that, uh, but I'm thinking we can make uh, writing REST APIs possible instead of hard. Good. Let's start with a this is Dancer, I think. This is what Dancer is, a simple but powerful web application framework for Perl. So let's do something simple. Let's do a very simple web application, the hello world thingy. Uh, we'll do a get request somewhere, we have an index file, uh, we do some layout stuff. If you're not familiar with Dancer, this is a very, very brief thing. Um, so next will be, we're going to make a package called Simple Web, and what will it do? It will use Dancer, it will have a route, the root, usually the index. Um, are we going to render that in a template called index? Yay! And that's our Dancer application. Now it needs, of course, uh, to have, uh, what does it need? It needs to have an index TT, where we have the very, very basic thing that's going to render a string called Hello World. Um, it has layouts, and in this layout we will render the content from that previous thing, the hello world thing, and well, it's very complicated already. Um, the config file for you is going to tell you that we have a simple TT that's wrapped around everything we're going to render. And uh, yes, we are ready to set and go. There we go. This is uh, the last bit, probably the way to set up a Dancer application. There's an easier way, but the moment you start doing anything complicated, you will start running using Black Builder, um, which is going to be way more interesting. Uh, sorry to tell you very much examples of what to do with Black Builder. Once you start using plugins, uh, middleware, I think you should use a lot of middleware when possible. You will use these kind of things. So this is my uh, application. Run this thing, and yes, there we go. Woohoo! We have a web application called Simple Web Example, and we can display Hello World if we go to the root of this 0 0.500 URL. Good. Basic, very basic uh, API. I'm well, sorry, very basic web example. Let's make it more interesting. Let's make something dynamic. Let's do some DBI class stuff here because you want to have a database connected to a thing and it will be clear why. So this user thing will have a route get, get users and we're going to get some details of a specific user. Uh, we're going to do some stuff with a schema for a specific user. We're going to show you how that's looking like. We're going to have different templates and a different configuration. So. The sample web users uh, API, uh, sorry, Dancer application. How is that going to look like? Well, we have the new sample web users thing. We're going to use the DBI class plugin. This is the one where we're going to uh, look up users. We can get the whole list of users probably. 
you can search for them. This is how you get the details. And yes, we need some help, some implementation details, like how are you going to do the get uh, users and the get user details. So this is your get users. It's uh, going to call a separate uh, code reference for you. We are going to look up for if there is a name parameter in our request. If so, then we are going to search for it in DBX class. Uh, if there is something that likes, uh, looks like a name, and yes, we are going to have that. If not, if we don't have a parameter called name, we are going to just give you all the users. And we render the whole result in a template for users. Okay. The other one, if you want to get user details, well, it's not much so different. We are just going to search for a specific user with a specific user ID. And if you have none of them, we come to return a 404, and otherwise we render the results in a template called user details. Still very basic, and I'm going to it step by step for a specific reason. Um, so, this is going to be a little bit more interesting. This is our DBX class schema. Very quickly, the class name. Um, we're going to use candy because candy is nice. <coughs> we're going to create a table. We're going to have one, two, three, four different fields in it. And yes, I want to have some other indexes. And that's how we create them, if you want to know. Good. The templates. Oh, yes, the templates. Very basic. This is our uh, user templates. It's going to show you uh, a table. Uh, in the, sorry, oh, I want to fast. Uh, it's not going to show you a table, it's going to show you a form. So you can enter a name and you can search on it. And if you don't have, um, and if you have a whole list of them, you can just go to template toolkit and say if you have any users, going to render a whole table and in the table we will going to go over all the users we can find in our result list. And well, we have the simple templates here, we can have a header, and this is what you do in the table itself. The table itself will show you the username, and it will show you a href to the details page of it. Good. Our configuration file is going to be changing a little bit because we have this plugin, and we have this nice DSN that will Make sure that we can connect to our own SQL Lite database and we have the schema called my data, my data schema. Uh, not very interesting. Then we should come to run this application and once it runs, hmm, let's see this. This is what you get when you go to slash users. Tiny form and yes, oh, we have two users in the database. Good. We can search for a specific user called John. And if we go to the link, we will find his user details. We get Tom Doe with a nickname today and his email address. This is about the most basic dynamic web application you can build with DBX class and then. So far, so good. We're not going to talk about web pages, we're going to talk about the REST API. And this was all introduction. REST APIs. There's a definition for REST. There's a couple of things you have to think about if you're going to build a REST API. There's a whole REST architectural design things you have to think about. And one of them is to call the uniform interface. Uh, it's going to talk about all the header files, other uh, headers you have in your HTTP request and responses, the status codes that are important for it. It's, uh, Stateless interaction, we don't go into tell the server, uh, please remind yourself that if I come back to you, you should do this. No, everything you transfer is a specific state of a resource. It is not going to bother the server with it. The only one that can remember itself is you, you as a client, you can know what kind of state you are in, and that's what you transfer back to the server again if you're going to update. It's cacheable. Very important for the whole HTTP, the whole web, and specific for REST, is that it's cacheable. Speeding up, uh, Leo was giving a talk on how to speed up the web. It's cacheable, and to make it cacheable, you have to think about a lot of stuff. Um, <coughs> it's 
server, client does not need to know how the server has implemented, the server doesn't know anything about the client, there is no connection between them, we are just going to transfer state of resources. And we have a layered system, meaning that anywhere in between we can have a uh, specific server. The client does not know if it's talking to a cache, a proxy <coughs> server. The server doesn't know if it's going to talk to the client strictly or if there is a cache in between. And then we have something that's code on demand, which is a funny thing to do. I've never seen it in real life situations. Probably PJSON is something that might do something like that. Anyways. REST in general. Serialize with JSON. Serialize with JSON is a very, very handy uh, tool to create REST APIs. It takes away a lot of pain, a lot of headaches to make sure that you can transmit JSON. Let's try to extend our web application we had, our web pages, to an API. And we will have a slash will have a user ID. Oh, I think that should be slash users. Anyways, good. Uh, we're going to use the serializer JSON plugin, and this is more or less our dancer to application how it's looked like. And this is from our previous thing. We are now only changing it into API users. There are a few other things. We are going to change the user details into a little bit more REST interface for REST you will just have the ID behind the slash users and you will find this user ID details for it no longer the URL called uh, user details don't need it anymore there's a whole thing about URLs I've talked about it in previous talks and you can read up on the web much about how to design your APIs that's not what I'm talking about this afternoon good slash users how can we find these slash users and what's going to be different from what we have? Because this is what we had from our web page when we did that. Going to change a little bit? Oh, we're not going to return the uh, template anymore. We are just going to return a ugly piece of uh, curl. If you can see what it's doing straight from the beginning, great for you. What it's doing is returning you a array reference that's being a map over all the users we can find and it's going to return for every user a hash ref which has a uh, href and a label just as we have seen before then the user details we have to change that a little bit how are we going to change it? well, let's change it bit by bit clean up a little bit of code and no longer we have slash user details, we have the slash users with some user ID behind it. Then the other thing is we are going to change uh, the results more or less like if we can't find it, I need to clean up a bit. We're going to return you a 404 page, not a page, an error just the code by itself. And then we have some other things to return, we have to return a data structure rather than a template we are going to render and this structure looks like this it's going to return a hash ref with well a bunch of fields in it good so this is our change from what we had to create a rest api configuration file yes of course we love configuration files this is going to hide a lot of stuff away make it uh, more easy for you configuration file needs to change we have a serializer called json and I love to have pretty prints. Makes it much more readable. Good. Let's try to run this API. Let's try if we can connect it. We no longer have the web as a web server. We can't use our browsers anymore. Yes, you can maybe, but it's not the way we should do it. So just use a thing that's called curl and let's connect to the thing. Good. Let's see what we get back. This is what we get back. Of course, we have status code 200. At least I hope we have it. If not, then something went really wrong. It already tells you that we now have a result that's in a content type application JSON. And yes, it's going to return you a 
a ref of two hrefs with these data in it. Good. I'm fine with that. In a JSON structure, of course. Um, this one. Let's search for this user called John. What will he return if you go to the same URL, but we can search for it? This is what we return. If we want to one of these users. Or if there were more Johns, we will have more Johns here. Anyways, so we have this magnificent URL, href I call it, slash users and then a UUID. Let's try to go to this resource and get what is there. If I do the code, go to Azure, <coughs> and this is what it will show. Whoopee! It will show the details of John Doe, which has a nice email address and a nickname. This is more or less the first bit of a REST API each thing, because we have skipped so much. Let's move on a little bit, because we have now one serializer called uh, JSON. Uh, the funny thing is about the REST, uh, about the REST API is that you can do some kind of content negotiation. You can say, oh, I don't want JSON, I want XML, or something else, like uh, data dump. Yeah, data numbers are wonderful uh, for what? We will love it. Most people don't like it. They mention return as JAL. And yes, you start thinking, oh no, this is going to be horrible. Now we have free serializers, and how can we do that? Well, it wouldn't be Dancer if it would be made easy. So, what about Dancer serializer mutable? It's going to change so much in your code. Look what's going to change to just serve you all these different formats. Well, let's do our first change. First change in the code. We don't have change in the code. That's correct. No code change. We have only one change in the configuration file. It's called mutable. No longer JSON. Now, if I go to this URL, this is what I get. I have to tell you that you want a text JSON or an application JSON or whatever. You have to specify which format you want. If you don't specify it, it will blow up your server. It shouldn't. That's a different thing. Good. If I come back with this uh, from this request, I will get this kind of structure back. Uh, it's not as pretty as it was, but yes, we can still read it. It's still the same resource we get back. A user with name John. And this one, we can code for a YAML version. Yes, we have YAML here. Woohoo! And for example, data number, yes, oh, it's getting boring now. We have a data number result. That's what you can do with content negotiation. You simply change your headers and say, I want this specific content type. And it will do it for you. Dancer, serializer, mutable is a wonderful thing. However, you must provide a exit pattern. It doesn't know how to resolve it if you don't provide it. It doesn't automatically default to JSON or whatever. And it does a lot of nasty stuff under the hood as well, which are not RFC compliant. There's another one that's going to deal with these kind of stuff. So I go through a little bit more of these plugins that are available to help you create your Dancer 2 application, which is then a REST API. Plugin REST. I hate the description. It's saying that it's going to be a RESTful implementation of your application. It's doing not even half of what's restful. So, change the name, please. Okay. Anyways, uh, what's it doing? It's doing crubs. Create, read, update, or delete. It's creating these routes very quickly for you. It's talking for about resources and resources with an ID. It uh, can take a file extension instead of the content uh, type, uh, sorry, the accept types in your headers. And it does uh, co 
come with a lot of pre-configured standard serialization. It's very easy to use. Back to our example. This is what we had. This is what we're going to change. There's a little bit of change we have. We're going to make a little bit of room because we need to have an extra plugin entered in our Dancer 2 application. And we have something that's saying to initialize the whole thing for you. But then, now it comes fun. The users there, get slash users. Now we go to extend it a little bit, we're going to add the format of it. And for the user details, we're going to change it in uh, slash user slash the ID of the user and a format behind it. That's our extension. So, this is what we had. Get this specific user, I want to have some details from this user. What's going to happen? 500. No, not the 500. No. Because we said that it would have a file extension, the URL does not end in .json. So what we will get? A 404. It doesn't exist. What? It doesn't exist anymore. So what we should have done, yes, you should have added the .json edit, and this is what you get back then. You get a nice application, JSON structure, and yes, it felt be fine again. We can do it with the YAML, and we get the YAML back. Yes, so the plugin REST, what is so funny? The except headers, which are part of the HTTP specifications, are not being used. That's silly. And 404 is unfortunately a correct thing. The dot whatever file doesn't exist. It's not there. I hate it, but it's true. If you ask for a dot XML, it's not there. Correct, but it's not how HTTP REST API should be designed with a file extension. Good. So far, so good. We have done something about the content type. Something about like content negotiation. There's another one I'll show you that might help you. You are all British people. Some people are not from Britain. Who's not from Britain? Alright, you speak in different language. Good. Let's go to Multilingual design. We yeah, have a plugin called Multilingual. Ah, oh, it's fun as well. The Multilingual plugin, what's it doing? Well, what it's going to do is it's going to prepend a language thingy in front of the resource, which can be very handy so we can address, uh, uh, let's say, slash en, slash, and then do the rest of the resource, or nl for Dutch people, or fn, fr for French. Good. It does do some evil redirects, however. Okay, but it works. And that's the fun, it works. Good, this is what I'm going to show you, because we're doing multilingual things. I can't go on with the user, because the user doesn't have any multilingual uh, data in it. So this is a bit strange example I'm quickly showing you. What's it all about? Well, let's see. It's using the plugin multilang, multilang. Yeah. Um, then uh, we have this still here. I will use it later on. We still can use the, the, the different formats, so that's fun. We can have different ways of representing our data. Um, a big data structure here. It's uh, having a few translations of morning, afternoon, evening, and night. That's in English and in Dutch. And let's see how that's going to work. We can just go to this URL slash translations. And it will return the hash ref somehow, and it will, just like the other thing, pass back to the JSON serializer, or the, X, or the YAML serializer, or the data number serializer, and it will return the language one you have chosen. So, of course, config. Yes, we have the multilingual thing being set up. We have two different languages we can support. And if you don't support anything, you'll go for English. Fine. Good. Good to go. Run this whole thing, start your uh, dancer application, and go to curl. Let's see what curl is going to do for us. We're going to say, I want this translation in JSON format in the language Dutch. 
And yes, it's doing it. Ooh. Content type application JSON. Yes, that's what I was for. I didn't ask for a cookie. Get rid of it. Anyways, um, and this is the Dutch version. Goedenavond is for evening. Goedemorgen is for morning. And Goedenacht is for good night. Proper. It's working. Yes, multi line is a nice plugin. Of course. Is it? Of course, there's something missing. What about this? Even though English is the first one mentioned, no, it's the first one mentioned, but it gets you a quality factor of 0 0.9, means that, yes, I'm Dutch. I prefer actually Dutch. Um, and if you can't find Dutch, do the English version. Or what about this one? That must be lovely for you, people from the, from the UK. Uh, I'd love to have Great Britain. Uh, well, that's not good. Should be US, isn't it? Anyways, yes, <laughs> it should be EN UK and EN US, I think. Yeah, yeah right. EN US would be the correct country code. GB is the correct country code for the United Kingdom. All right. So the last one should be the it should be EN US instead of the EN UK. Yes. And my example be true. Well, the other thing, if you would live in uh, Ukraine, um, you would have two different versions of the language. It's the Cyrillic one or the Latin one. These kinds of things are simply not supported by multi-line. Multi-line only supports the first two characters of your uh, content language. And if you've noticed in the response, it does not set the content language. It just skips it. I don't know. So, time to do better, I hope. I thought I could do better. And I started writing a bunch of plugins. And I call them plugin HTTP and then whatever. So, since we're talking about content negotiation, the first plugin called content negotiation. What's it doing? Well, it will have a bunch of header files. One is the accept. The other one will be accept language. It will try to make sure that we have the proper response headers. And let's try to implement it, what we just had, our translation table with content negotiation. This is how it goes. This is what we had. We changed this one. We released the rest more or less. Uh, however, this, yes, I need a little bit more space. Um, I'm going to clean up this for a while so I have more space on the screen. Goes up there, good. This is what I want, no longer the dot format, because it's not part of it. And then, yes, this is a little bit ugly, I think. Looks horrifying at the beginning. So let's go by it step by step. I have a language um, thing, so I can choose the HTTP language. Um, and this come with a list of languages you can choose from and a code read for each different language. But, however, what I did uh, very quickly is I took the whole list of languages we had in our list. So it's dynamic already. I'm not stuck to my English or Dutch. I can simply add French to my data structure or whatever. Um, for every language mentioned there, it will run this code ref, which is just doing this translation thing. And if you want to know which language I have chosen, well, it has a keyword for dancer HTTP chosen language. And if you don't provide a language or you have the wrong language, yes, let's go to default for English. Because we are in Britain, we like English. It's what to do. Good. Um, the configuration file needs to change. Yes, what will change in the configuration file? Woo! Get rid of a lot of stuff. I like getting rid of stuff. Good. Uh, yeah, it does say plugin HTTP content negotiation default is English. With a star. Probably means that it's not implemented yet. So, yes, I have been working hard to get it out. I love to get feedback, but this is one of the things that it certainly will change. I will have these default values in my configuration files. Good, this one. Let's try the <coughs> URL, blah, blah, translation things. And I can now 
have this funny thing with a complex, uh, again, ENUK. Oh, what have I been thinking? Anyways, good. If I would send this off to the server, it will do the whole content negotiation, it will take a whole language range things, and it will return you, hey, oh, hello. It's actually saying that the content language is Dutch in this case, which I think should be the right thing to do. <coughs> I'd love to be right. Okay. So, HTTP content negotiation does accept language with the language range, and it does set up the response headers for content language. Back to our original example. <coughs> Is it? No, we stay with the translation still. Yes, I'm sorry. Because we had that example where we can say I want JSON, or I want YAML, or I want whatever. Let's see how we can implement that. This is what we had, we need to change it. What we're going to change, oh, make a little room, and add this HTTP choose media type. Well, media type is not an official way to uh, talk about HTTP headers. It's called accept and nothing. All the other ones have accept language, or accept <coughs> car set, or accept encoding. And yeah, this was just confusing, so I made this media type thing. There it is, and it goes through a table of, well, application JSON. What do you need to do when you have an application JSON? You execute that subroutine. You convert it to JSON, or well, YAML or data dump. It's a little bit explicit, but the serializers provided by Tensor are limited. There are only three of them, and if you want to do something else, what about creating a PDF? What about creating an image on the fly? This way, you can simply add these different uh, content types to my structure, and it will simply create a new subroutine for it. Easy to extend. And let's, lastly, I default to undef. Why to undef? I want you to be very specific what kind of content type you want. If you don't provide a content type, sorry. <coughs> so, run this application, go to this URL with curl, get HTTP translations, my exit language, it should be fine. And what should we return? Very good. Mike is, Mike is awake. <laughs> because we didn't provide the content type. We didn't, sorry, we didn't provide the accept header. And I just said in this slide here, if we don't provide anything, it's going to default to nothing, so it will be an error. So, good. So let's do it. Add that accept header and say we want JSON and look what we get back. Ooh, wow. Hmm, what's this? Very accept language and accept. This is very handy if you're passing a proxy server, a caching server, whatever you have, because all of a sudden we have to deal with the different representations of this same resource, the same John. Oh no, this is not John. The same translation table. We have it in different languages. We have it in different types. Your caching server now needs to know that. By the way, this URL is fine, it's the same URL. But please have a look in the accept language or in the accept headers. If they change, you have a real different response. Your caching servers need to know this. So, back to our user example. The real thing. We come to change this. This is what was. We're going to have different resources, uh, sorry, different representations of our resources. I want to have different uh, content types, I'm not going to do the language here. Make some room, add this whole thing here, add these media types, although well, we've seen it before. Uh, this is very easy to run. Well, there's one exception though. In the previous slide, you might have seen the whole data structure I created from uh, DDAX class. I created quickly a underscore serialized thing to just give me the only the fields I really want. The DBX class now having a little bit more stuff, so I only want the email, nickname, and the name of the user. 
So that's why I have these here. Good. And um, a little bit different changes for the user ID. And this is going to change a little bit more. So we have now different media types for the slash users. We have different media types for slash users with an ID. And it will work. It will have accept, it will have accept language. It will do the accept encoding. It will do accept car set. I'm not sure how we can use them actually, but it's implemented. It will give you a 406 when you're having uh, a non-acceptable error uh, request and you cannot figure out what you want. Don't ask for English if you have, oh, sorry, don't ask for German if you can't provide German. For languages though, it's fine to find a different language because not every book German is that limited in his brain so that he can only read German. Most Germans are fine with English, so maybe you should default to English. However, if you are talking with an API and you say, I need JSON back, or I need XML back, don't bring something else, because your server, your client doesn't know what to do with. Luckily, your client, because it now knows what kind of content is being provided, unlike the other plugins, it will say, this is content type, this application, XML. Your client check, oh, by the way, is it JSON? No, it's not JSON. Ooh, now we screwed. So, but please don't send stupid data back if your client doesn't want it. Good. I talked about caching. And you saw those headers about um, very. Talk about caching. Caching actually is very simple on the server side. Very simple. Because the server only has to tell you a few things. Caching is key component of the whole REST architecture. Um, it's that layered system where the client and the server do not know who's talking. The server doesn't know if it's the real client. The client doesn't know if there's a server in between. So we need to make sure that the cache that's in between does handle all the stuff for us. So what does it need to know? Well, it needs to know something about aging, how long your request and your response can be there in the caching server. We don't want very old responses. You need to know when these responses are actually being expired. That's just an absolute date time. It's not something relative to uh, aging. Aging is relative. And what it needs to do is a lot of validation. And it's doing a lot more in the caching. One thing this plugin won't do for you, it's not doing any caching. And I don't know if I will ever build a cache for Dancer 2. I think a cache should be in black middleware or it should be anywhere else. But your Dancer application itself, I do not see any good reason to build it into Dancer 2. Maybe other people disagree on it, come to me and I will implement it. Anyways, good. Our app. We had this already, and we just want to make sure that our caching services down the line know how long they can keep it, uh, how old it can be, and some other directives. If it needs to be private, if it needs to be public, if it needs to be... A dozen different things there are available for caching. Read it up on specs and you'll see that how, what you can do with it. So, let's create some space and let's add some very interesting things for caching. Woo! You can say how long, how old it can be. It can only be one hour old. Woo! And it can be stored in any public cache. Woo! And it will expire tonight. Tomorrow night. Tonight. It will expire tonight. When we are all having our beer, it will expire. Good. That's all the changes. Nothing exciting. Don't get confused. This has nothing to do with validation of your cache. This is only telling your caching server, hold on, this is what you need to know. Good. However, if you were talking about caching, there is something that a cache should do. A cache should do once in a while 
do a conditional request. It should validate if the stuff it has is still the right stuff it can serve. Yes, it has its max age, but it might be told by your original server that any request, please come back to me, revalidate if we are still okay, if you can serve it. It might help to just ease to talk to each other. So once it's okay that the, ser the caching server is told, yes, you can serve your cached version, the original server doesn't have to send off all the data again. What about your video files of 3 megabytes or whatever? You don't have to send them again. So, there are conditional requests. Reuse for get, for get requests, cache revalidation, you can have an e-tag. I'm not going to tell, talk much about the e-tag, but it's a unique string for this specific resource in this specific state. It's not changed anywhere else. Um, the date modified, I will talk about during this talk. It's more easy to understand and more easy to implement. <coughs> but the e-tag is implemented in the plugin. Good. This is what we had in our um, database schema. I'm going to change it a little bit because I want to have this timestamp. I want to know when it's last modified. So, clean up a little bit. Uh, have a package load components in flake column date time and we want to have a timestamp in it. It's making it very easy with DBX class to do it. Um, and this is my definition of my column. The moment it's get created or it's uh, updated, it will automatically do that for you. So my current last update will be always the correct one. We need it. So there it is. Then, um, what needs to be changed in this uh, slash user and the ID of it? Just a little bit. We already have this. We have these caching parameters. We have the aging. We have the expired date. But we need to make this request now conditional because your caching server comes back to this original server and says, Hello, I have this specific request. Can I still serve it? What are we going to do? Create a little room. We're going to make a code ref from what we already have because this piece of code is going to be conditional. We either have something that we can tell to the server. It's fine, you're okay serve it to the rest of the world, or we have to regenerate our response. This is our HTTP conditional. It says if the last modified, and you can grab the date time from the last update from the user. And that's it. This is doing the whole thing for your conditional request. If your last modified has been changed, you have to serve this one. And I've not, then it's okay. Okay, good. Let's go to this request. Let's see what happens. Just get now this resource. And what it does, it will show you the last modification date. When was that? Today somewhere? Yeah. You're on lunch. Yes, I know. I have been late creating these slides. <laughs> so, our uh, John Doe record in the database is last modified this afternoon. Good. We not need to know that because the moment a caching server has this thing, a last modified date, it can now come back to your original server. I'm talking about caching servers. By the way, your applications you built yourself, your web applications, your iPhone applications, whatever you've built, your one page nice shiny things with all the JavaScript, etc. They can have caching. We have HTML5 data. We can store data there. So try to use it. But anyways, you have now a last modified date. You go back to the original server. Hello. I have something. Uh, send me something back if it has been modified since this afternoon. Well, I haven't changed the database. So what will it send me back? It will send me back this, three or four. It has to be modified. We don't have to transfer all the data. We just send this code back to the caching server or the application that wants to know if it's modified. And that's what I'm doing. 
Had it been modified, yes, it will send all the data from the database again and then regenerate the representation for you and probably okay. Then to plugin HP conditional request. Yes, it will do the correct thing for cache validation and it will send you off the 304 if not modified. Let's take it one step further. Because conditional requests are used for one specific thing as well. You don't want, if this, you're in a multi-user environment, that user 1 does this with the data and user 2 wants to update something and is overwriting the previous changes. So, since we are using a stateless situation, we cannot, as a client, tell to the database, I need to work on this stuff, please lock the database, lock this row, nobody else can access it. We can't do that. Not in a REST API. So, we have these e tags and these date modifies. That if nothing has changed, I'm probably the one that's having a current version. Now I can ask the server to update this whole thing. And if client 2 comes to the thing like, I don't want to update something, it will say, sorry, I have changed in the meantime. You have a wrong representation yourself. Fix yourself. Uh, maybe you should do a get request to get the latest version of myself and then show the user what my latest version is and then do updates and whatever. But don't cause these lost updates. So, the puts. We haven't seen any put yet, but a put request um, is very easy to implement as well. If you have seen the get, going to quickly over it, and this is what it's doing. Um, it has to, has to be conditional there, it's doing the sub there, it's going to do the last modified again. And I'm going to tell you it's required. And why does it need to be required? Because this is not a thing that you can skip. We don't want these users to update stuff you have just changed. For a GET request, I'm fine if you don't provide me with a last modified date, I will just give you it, the resource. Good. My request, how is it going to look like? Well, this is my request, and I'm going to send it off with this content type application JSON. Um, we're going to update the whole thing. So user John Doe will now have a... Well, didn't change the data. Well, we could have changed the data here. Johan Doe. Johan Doe, very good. Let us change to Johan Doe. Instead of Joe Doe, John Doe. So, let's change John Doe to Johan Doe. Oh, there we go. Woo! Why? Because we just have designed our application that if we don't provide our headers, come back with an error. I need to come back with these conditional request headers. If you don't, I'm not going to do anything for you. Because I can't validate it. So, let's change it. Let's change it to if unmodified since. So, if we have not been modified since midnight, when I was working on my presentation, then we can do this. If you remember, John Doe was updated this afternoon. So this should result in a 412 precondition failed. It's not going to do it for you. Okay, finally. If it's then changed after this afternoon, can we then put this new value of John Doe into the database? So, that's a plugin HTTP conditional requests. Um, this one will actually do the right thing, and that's what I hope to do with these plugins. It's going to give you the 428 that you have no preconditions with it. It will say when you're not uh, updated enough, and it will give you an OK if it can do it. This one, I won't talk about it. By the way, it's only there because I once tried to build it a year ago. There's a guy here in the room that's still going to go through with code review with me to make sure that's actually doing the right thing. Since a year, it's fine. Kluge was a nice man moment to work on it. Um, it will make it very easy to do things like this. 
um, where you can have, make sure that your requests are authenticated. You just have an HTTP require role admin, and you can only do this whole thing if you are an admin. If not, it will come back with a 403 in all price. So, this thing, plug in HTTP bundle, that's my last one. Why? Because I was getting annoyed with all these headers. My goodness, this is my Dungeon 2 application with all these use, 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 use. Let's make life really easy. Let's do, hey, come on, let's do this. Use Dungeon 2 plugin HTTP bundle. And I hope by this one, everybody can now make a REST API built on Dancer 2 that is not doing the bogus thing with multilingual, not doing the limited things with uh, serialized JSON or serialized immutable. This is the one that's doing the things that have been written in the HTTP specs. I've taken a year to write them, reading all these specs, reading again. Yes, they're buggy because they're built on top of action pack headers, HTTP written by two marvelous guys in the pro community. So I have to read more on my implementation of a lot of things. But it's a win. It's released just uh, two weeks ago. Anything that you see in these plugins that is bucky needs to change. I'm willing to uh, read through it and discuss it with you, make sure that it's still HTTP compliant, RFC compliant, and I hope from now on people can just write simple REST APIs built on Dancer. Dancer 2 is a marvelous framework. Thank you very much.